We will begin this morning with Elizabeth McKim, and Don White will follow. I'd like to say I think that the city of Lynn obviously is a harbor for much literary and musical talent there, as both of our features reside there and came from Lynn this morning. In fact, they carpooled over. So we'll begin with Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a poet and a teacher whose work is rooted in the oral tradition of poem, story, and song. She grew up in the country in Farmington, Connecticut. And Elizabeth's words for her bio were so beautiful, I just wanted to share them directly with you. I was immersed in where seasons, where there were the seasons, and I was with my ear to the earth. I loved rhythms and pulse of all languages and songs, including jump rope songs and magic spells. I was a true believer. I danced and did movement, played music, and experienced the connection of painting and drawing. Elizabeth went on after school and said that her interior world became intense, which influenced her writing at that time, influenced by such happenings as the 60s and Vietnam and the assassinations and protest and divorce and counterculture and the liberation movements. And she said, my changing relationships also influenced my writing and my friendships, political and my personal life. My decade with Etheridge Knight, African-American poet, master of the oral tradition. They all changed me so now my work is a mixture of urban, nature, and family, always expanding. Elizabeth worked in many public schools with children, and she has also taught outside of the country. She has five books of poetry, the latest being Red Thread, which we have here today for sale. And she also has performed in our country as well as outside of the country. And in Europe, in fact, she has been called Poet Laureate. Tony Toledo has referred to Elizabeth as Poet of Jazz. And what Elizabeth says herself about her experience being a poet and musician is, I've been lucky and blessed to be a poet in a community of singing as a singing creature among many. So we look forward to hearing all that she has to share with us this morning. Please help me give a warm welcome to Elizabeth McKim. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. A great pleasure. It's always nice to be in this area. I have very fond uh, remembrances as a young poet and uh, working in the public schools to doing many um, uh, readings around in this area, and I always felt that the people here were very welcoming, and I appreciate it. It was great to hear um, the poets and singers that I have uh, just heard, and uh, I'm looking forward to more. And uh, Cheryl, thanks so much for including me this morning, and uh, also my friend Don, which I'm looking forward to hearing. So yeah, the, the, the tradition of song, story, and poem is really the tradition that I put my, um, where my, where my footprints begin. I do do a lot of work with children. I have since the very beginning of the Poets in the Schools program here in Massachusetts. And this is a poem that came from giving directions to a, um, a class of children about looking at a shell. Hold it. Warm it with your own life. Listen to its near and far pulse, the sounds, the messages. Find out where it was born, the year, the time, and who was there and why. Find out the nature of its fear, what cave or cliff or curve of tide has touched it, tended it, mended it. Find out what it can know of parents, what song and language it was taught, and if it has a friend, an enemy, what stains and cracks and marks 
distinguish it, what surface opens to the air, what inside heart is hiding there, and learn the way it lives and breathes, and how it moves upon this earth. Thank you. Stories. Well, I think poems often are little stories, like the haiku by one of the haiku masters. Since my house burned down, I now own a better view of the rising moon. <laughs> stories. There are stories I do not want to explain, stories which cause me pain, stories to make fall the rain, stories that speak and have no sound, stories that fall seven stories to the ground, stories that tell and do not tell, stories that are just a little bitty yell, stories that give voice, stories that lift off and rejoice, stories that cat about and carouse, stories that are sweet skin deep and arouse, stories which suddenly around the next corner appear and stories which disappear. There are stories born in fire and stories in the muck and mire. There are stories my mama knows and stories my mama will never know. There are stories to curtail and stories to wail, stories that dog and stories that zigzag, stories that are deep-rooted, and stories to shake the booty, trouble the bounty, stories to charm, stories to bear arms, stories we pray to forget, and stories which are birthdays and beget, stories for next time around and not yet, and hey, it's all part of one big story. Ah men and ah women, we hold on and let go. One world without end. Ah, ah men and women, ah men. These are a few poems about watching. I grew up watching the ground intensely. All found lost things called to me. We are they and they are we and what they do to us we do to each other and if one of us cannot breathe then none of us can breathe. Can you feel it? Watch. In the cusp of loving, I skim lonely in precise places near your home. I watch you, I watch you, I watch you, I watch you from upside the head, from waterbed, from book of the dead, from gibbous to full moon, from cow jump over the salty spoon, from telephone call from Duluth, from empty booth. From forget me, from not, from two roads taken, from two tongues shaken, from bring home the beacon, from downside, from under, from Easter, from Ramadan, from Pesach, from birth, from the mirror, from thunder, from the bridge, from the air, from what we share, from our local quicksilver lair, from when you look at me, from when I look at you, from when you look at me, from when I look at you, from the ridge, from mirth, from care, from the knife, from when we go home to our life. Two together gather roses, roses. Two together gather roses, roses. Two together gather roses, roses. Washed in the blood of our ordinary life. Thank you. This one is called A Vision, and this is a poem that, um, that is dedicated to Etheridge Knight, who was um, 
my friend, you know, uh, I actually, uh, Etheridge lived here in Worcester for, for some time, and so maybe some of you got a chance to hear him. And he was just really a wonderful poet. Vision. A complicated guy and a very wonderful poet. I saw you today in the white congregational church. You were sitting where my dad used to sit before he died. You were sweating. Your eyes were lollygagging. Couldn't tell if it was booze or pills or something else. You were singing, Willow, weep for me. Where you do. And every now and then you would howl, where's my woman? Where's my sweet woman? And the congregation pretended you were not there. They had whited out your fine pink tongue, your black face, your brown eyes with the telltale blue rings, your bend back fingers, your acy doocy hat. They knew you had not come this way, not for hundreds of years. Still, when you sang, Willow, weep for me, with that deep Mississippi poet man voice of yours, full force and open. They just had to look around. They tried to cover your blackness with rock of ages, but it didn't work. You kept on singing. You didn't care. Old Rev got nervous. You didn't care. It was snowing in New England. You didn't care. The sound reached my inner ear and rattled the bones. You kept on singing. You didn't care. So I do uh, really feel so much this whole um, being an artist in the community, I think that's so important for all of us, each one of us here today. We're all angels to each other. Deep in the doom where the dust comes from, soaring spies of the angel sky, our wings stained with sunrise juice, enjoining in the sluice and tides of revolution, 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 doing the endurance angel dance, slow and easy flip flap, revolutionary lip. Blap, loop the looping, hope the hoping, hoping, taking the fancy chances, angels of the ages, resting suspended, coming unmended, angels of the rages, rising through the blood tide, wide sweep, wide sweep skyline, deep in the doom where the dust comes from. We are all angels to each other. Thank you. Wounded voices cry under minarets and markets where please ricochet. One scarlet flower trembles and spills red petals in a field of oil. Making jazz swing in 17 syllables ain't no square poet's job. That's an Etheridge Night haiku <laughs> with that little beat there. I, um, bios, 
where we're from. Where do you come from? And where do you go? Where do you come from? I really want to know. I am from an old red pre-revolutionary house in a small town smack dab in the middle with low ceilings and wide floorboards. I'm from a babysitter in curlers singing above me, I want a paper dolly to call my own. I'm from a drugstore with round red leather seats, a white church with a white steeple, a red firehouse next door. I'm from a horse chestnut tree felled by a great hurricane. I'm from sitting in long grass and the cows not coming home. I'm from a low-lying house in the country. I'm from the predictable amazement of seasons the smell of mulch and maple, tomatoes vined in August sun, and my mother saying, all you need is chicken rice and a good green salad. I'm from pockets and wickets and ponds and stone walls and blood-red June roses and long corridors leading to the principal's office, a giant who looked like an angry eagle and a yellow school bus and a bully and a fat girl with sweat stains down to her waist. I'm from the Barnum and Bailey Circus Fire last of the big tops. I'm from the life-saving flap where we got under. I'm from trips on the Connecticut company bus into Hartford to visit Miss Angelo, ballet lessons with a skeleton she called God's holy temple. I'm from VJ Day and a naked lady answering her door. Well, my dad told me to go and tell her the war is over. I'm from reading after dinner. Everybody reads. I am from lost feelings and confused notions. I'm from alcoholic potions. I'm from sexual encounters and blood on the counter. I am from Vietnam and a brother-in-law gone. Protests, redress, distress. I am from Maria Magdalena Escudera and Francisco Marin. I am from Minorcan indentured servitude in the New World, Catalanian traces. I am from 10 years of love, African American style. I am from Indy, not India, where Etheridge was dying of lung cancer. I am from poetry, taking me around 2,000 blocks. I am from head in the clouds and hands in the mud. I am from, from doing the boogie and getting tired, tirelessly. I am from one daughter, one son-in-law, granddaughter, grandson, Chloe and Max, friends and family who sustain me, two sisters, two brothers-in-law unfurling me as I move with them. I am from wide as the sky and deep as the sea, from you and me and us and ride the poetry bus. I am from don't walk here and don't say that. I am from heat and property, heart and poetry, the streets richness and poverty and war Warfare, counter sit in 60s, Vietnam, Lil Emmett Till, and cannabis, and infraction in Kansas and Indiana, and Wenatchee Apple Orchard reading poetry on a flatbed truck. I am from Tenants Harbor, Maine, and swimming the length of the dock. I am from Paris and Swiss piggies. I'm from an English boyfriend when I was 13. I am from Balinese, Barong, and a treehouse made of thatch and bamboo. I am from lions and dragons. I am from a loft in Lynn built by a Welsh shoeman, Dagger, used to store shoe machines, laborers tap-tapping, tap-tapping, tap-tapping in the hot nights. I am from under the umbrella of Farini in Gloucester. I am from Wednesday nights at Tatiana's on Market Street with all the storytellers and singers of glad sin and sorrow. I am from hauling myself up and down this hill of beans forever and ever till tomorrow in woe and sorrow and wah wah and yay yay and yes yes and amen and women. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> so um, and Cheryl will you uh, start wa flailing around when I get when my time is up okay. So, uh, is that you back there so I can see you okay. Okay. The moon. The moon. The moon's exhausted its patience with us and goes out for a quick smoke. 
Sometime later, she saunters back to the night sky, stealing the last show. <laughs> the moon and the sidewalk, a love story, an exchange. La lune et le trottoir. Mais qu'est-ce qu'il y a? What's going on? La lune est sur le trottoir. The moon is on the sidewalk. Et le trottoir brille. And the sidewalk is shining. Mais écoute, chérie. But listen, sweetheart. La lune ne coûte rien. The moon costs nothing. Et le trottoir and the sidewalk, tout, 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 ce que, ce que, ce que tu es, all that you are. Mais laisse-la tranquille, je t'en prie. Hey, leave it alone, I'm begging you. Regarde là-bas, look over there. Le trottoir se respire maintenant. The sidewalk is breathing into itself, secret, passionant, secret, and passionate. Et la lune, la lune est dure et inflexible. The moon is tough. The moon will not give in. <laughs> See that... The sidewalk is supposed to take on the aspects of the uh, the moon, and the moon in the relationship begins to take on the aspects of the sidewalk. Now I'm an old one. I relish my savory past and chew on the bones. This one is called limp because I have arthritis now and probably going to have a, a hip operation very soon. Limp. And these are little linked haikus. Oh, yeah, I got it. Maybe you'll get it too if you live long enough. It's nothing really. And yes, it bores into me when the hawk circles or the weather breaks or the wind opens the hole in my heart and I... Remember being wild and strong and young, running toward you in spring. Oh, okay. This is a, I like to do this blues poem. And it's a poem for Penelope, the wife of Odysseus. It's called... Penelope's Talking Blues. Penelope's Talking Blues. Ding a ding 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 ding. I wish Don was up here giving me a blues backbeat. <laughs> ding 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 ding. I first saw you, Otis, coming out of the boxcar side, holding on to Adam's rib. It cannot be denied, I testify. You know that old Adam's rib I'm talking about, Otis, the one with the sweet female juice, deep down in the deep down, deep down inside, so you'd never no more in these sorrowful days. You'd never no more be denied. But you, Otis, what did you do? What did you do? You tossed that old Adam's rib aside. Yeah, you tossed it aside like a nasty old dog bone. Said you could not use it on your ride. Oh, yeah, you said you could not use it on your personal ride. Think I don't remember that day? Think you can play me, play me, play me for a fool? Well, I can tell you, Otis, you learn more about love from me than you ever learn in any mother-loving traveling school. You think I don't remember that day when you looked at me, your wine-dark bride, and you said, babe, 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 I got a ride. Got to get me a little glory and some fame, and I got to avenge my daddy's name. Daddy, 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 that's all I heard. Daddy, 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 daddy. And yeah, I got a ride. Got to get me some glory and some fame. Got to avenge my daddy's name. Well, let me tell you, Otis, when you over there in Troy raising up a ruckus, I was back there in Ithaca, 
raising up our boy, Telemachus. Oh, yeah, in our home, our home. Do you remember our happy home way back there in Ithaca? Now it's a honky-tonk, a jukey joint, a funky old saloon, with all those raggedy-ass suitors crawling up and down my stairs, and me and my sorrow, yeah, me and my sorrow and despair, weaving and unweaving that weaving wool. Well, that's what happened, you know. Penelope sat back in that back room, and she kept weaving by day, and unweaving by night, weaving and unweaving that weaving wool, because she was afraid that those suitors, if they found that she had finished that cloth, they were going to marry her, and she didn't want that. Her name's Penelope. Yeah, her name's Penelope. Penelope, the wife of Odysseus. Not cacophony or poetry, infinity, inter eternity. The name's Penelope the wife of Odysseus. And sometimes I think to myself, yes, sirree, I think to myself, that man Odysseus, it's been 20 years now, that man Odysseus, he's never satisfied. And he won't be either till he hightails it cross country on an updraft and gets himself back here to Ithaca, right by my side. The name's Penelope. It cannot be denied. I testify. All right, so this, um, this is the last poem, and it's a poem that I like to do. It's called The Green Goes Over and Over. And, um, and actually, uh, for Don White there, I read this the night uh, that you weren't at our speak up over there in Lynn, and it was really also just to, um, to give my respect and um, thoughts to your father who'd just passed away. But really, it's for all of us. The green goes over and over, especially on this winter day. House, earth, water, sky. La maison, la terre, l'eau, la lumière, la casa, la tierra, el agua, la luz, ruma, bumi, air, langit, adama, bait, maim, shamaim, ada, bait, moi, shamoi. And the green, and the green, and the green, and the green, and the green goes over and over. And what is unfinished is always unfinished, and what is finished begins again. And the green, and the green, and the green, and the green goes over and over. We are scared. We are scared and sacred in the hoop of the world, and the green goes over and over. Give the love. Give the love, give the love the lasting pleasure. Give it in full measure. Find the fruit, be at the special spot. Beat the drum, be here, be there, be where, be here and there again. Again and once again, bear it, wear it, we are it. What else do we have? We do desire it. The heart of the matter rests on the roof of the sky. We only go by. We only go by. Thank you very much. As Don and Elizabeth are such good friends, Elizabeth had these words I'd like to begin introducing him with. Performing with Don White is a pleasure for me, as he is one of my favorite people in the neighborhood and on the planet, and his wife, Teresa, too, and his kids and grandbabies, and he inspires me, and I like to conspire with him in this wide field we move around in, and when you come right down to it, we all inspire each other. What else do we have? We do desire it. That was Elizabeth McKim. Thank you, Elizabeth. And so well said. And I would just like to add 
Don White as singer-songwriter and comedian and storyteller is beloved by many locally and beyond. Born in Lynn, where he has raised his family, which has inspired a great deal of his touching songs and stories. He started writing songs in sixth grade, and he has been inspired ever since in making people laugh and cry and really, really think and feel about what's important in life. Don has six CDs and one DVD and a book of his memoir-based stories. And I am very excited to have him here today with us. Please help me give a warm welcome to Don White. The only, the only time a poet is supposed to see this hour is when they've been up all night pontificating and see it from the other side. But uh, Elizabeth and I did get up nice and early and drive all the way out here to see you all. I want to have a nice round of applause for everybody who performed here so far today. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody else. Elizabeth. Rascal is the dog, he ain't too bright Me and Rascal were sitting on the couch last night When my woman come in, she started to cry She looked at us with such terror in her eyes She said, I have raised these children for 18 years Now they're growing up and they're moving out of here And my big reward for all that I have been through Is this dog as dumb as mud And you... Yippee Yahoo! Rascal looked at me in disbelief. He said, She can't be talking about you and me. She has got us to spend the rest of her whole life with. Would you please tell her how incredibly lucky she is? And I said, Who is going to love you any better than this? We'll wake you up every morning with a big wet kisses. When we hear the police sirens in your neighborhood, we throw our heads up in the air and we howl for you. Oh. And that's cool. You gotta admit, that's pretty cool. Well, you know, I don't believe we had succeeded in convincing her of the outrageous good fortune that had just befallen her. In fact, instead of looking happy as she could be, she looked a little bit, well, you know. Suicidal to me. Hey! Kids go to college, kids move away, but dogs and husbands, that's who stays. To you it seems like a big trick of fate, but me, me and Rascal don't see it that way. We're thinking, ain't we cuddly, ain't we cute? We're both real funny and we're both real true. There's another thing about us that is very cool. If you scratch us on our belly, our left leg moves. And you've got to admit that's cool. Oh. Oh. I think I'm scaring some of you people. Well, okay, so maybe we ain't that smart. We're a couple of mutts with a lot of heart. And this is what I look like when I'm flirting. And when I need new medication. <laughs> but no one could ever love you better or give you more loyalty than this dog as dumb as mud. Than this dog as dumb as mud. Than this dog as dumb as a mud. And me. How lucky can one girl be? She's got a dog like you and a man like me. We'll be together well and true this next century. Put that knife down, baby. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so... Um... This is how you can tell when a folk show is going down the drain, when a folk show, a folk performer puts on his $2 spectacles and, and says, I, and now I shall read an excerpt from my book. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This is my book. It's called Memoirs of a C Student. It took five years to write this book. I think if I was a B student, I could have done it in a week probably. 
And on the back of my book, there are some quotes from important people in my life. And here's a quote from my brother, Michael White, who um, drives a forklift at Logan Airport and is a very astute observer of the world. And these are his observations on his brother's alleged memoir. I knew that this book was going to be a pack of lies. (laughs) As soon as I saw the title, because my brother was a D student. That's what it says right there. My daughter's bedroom is next to the bedroom where my wife, myself, and exhaustion sleep. There has never been a real door on her room. We installed one of those flimsy folding doors that slides on tracks and opens and closes like an accordion. It has given her some privacy, but has deprived her of one of the key ingredients of a complete adolescence, a door that slams. I must admit to several moments of glee over the years when the door slamming exclamation point at the end of a teenage melodrama was replaced by the sound of little squeaky wheels sliding over aluminum runners. (laughs) All right. One night when my daughter was 15, exhaustion was beating me about the head and shoulders. It was 11.30 p.m. I could hear the 6 a.m. on the alarm clock actually taunting me. I'm going to ring as soon as you close your eyes, big guy. Now, my daughter was on the phone with one of her girlfriends. She was laughing. It was the kind of laugh that can only come from a 15-year-old girl. As something of a comedian, I have spent a disproportionate amount of my life studying the different sounds of laughter. In addition to the obvious fact that each person has his or her own unique laugh, it's kind of like a fingerprint when you think about it, there are several different types of laughter. The I can't believe it, that's just like my mother, warm laugh, the oh my god did he just say that on cable shock laugh. (laughs) The polite, unenthusiastic, almost obligatory laugh, the this guy is really scary, nervous laugh, etc. Now, to the untrained ear, all of these may sound pretty much the same. However, the laughter of a 15-year-old girl on the telephone with her best friend is a sound unlike any other on earth. I am lying in bed. I am so tired I could cry. I am not only being taunted by exhaustion and my alarm clock, but also by all the realities inflicted upon my life by every poor decision I have ever made. Sleep, even just a little bit of it, is the only remedy. Unfortunately, I am being denied this cure by the shrieks and wails of hysterical teenage laughter, devilishly dancing out of my daughter's room. I resolve that I must address the situation. I then begin the process of deciding which of my two available dad identities I should manifest in the bedroom doorway of my inconsiderate daughter. The goal being to deliver unto her the dad persona that will bring blessed quiet back to my domicile as quickly as possible with the least amount of energy output and ramifications. The first dad incarnation that comes to mind is the stereotypical blusterer. This is the one in which I storm over to her room and, with all the self-righteous indignation available to dad number one, I identify her crimes against humanity and the reasons why they are personally offensive to me. Then, using the loud, severely agitated, and totally unreasonable dad number one voice, I say, I am trying to get some sleep here. You don't care that I have to get up at six in the morning. Why should you? You get to sleep till noon. All you ever think about is yourself. It would never even occur to you that other people might actually be living in this house. (laughs) Then I flex my dictatorial muscle and say, hang that phone up right now. And then there is quiet. Quiet anger, quiet resentment, and quiet plotting of revenge. (laughs) 
You see, Tad number one always gets much more quiet than he bargained for. That's because he is 100% bluster and 0% circumspection. His short-sightedness is legendary. The method by which he seeks to attain his immediate goal actually fortifies the resolve of the opposition. He wins the battle at the expense of the war. He is a pawn of exhaustion and is destined to spend his waking hours in an endless cycle of explosive bravado followed by the need to apologize for it. Now, once dad number one is finished blowing off steam and asserting his authority in my mind, he gives the podium to dad number two. This dad is also driven to action by exhaustion, but unlike his surly cousin, he lacks the will to fight. Instead, he is a pleader. His method is to crawl out of bed, looking as pitiful as possible, and to speak in a defeated monotone. Ariel, honey... I have to get up early. Could you please use the telephone downstairs? Although sad and emasculated, this dad, if he accomplishes his goal, usually does so without creating a situation that he will feel obligated to repay her later. On this occasion, I, accuse, I choose to manifest dad number two. I conjure up my defeated monotone and roll it around in my mouth. I am preparing to climb out of bed and address the situation when a hitherto unknown door in my mind opens up and out steps dad number three. He speaks. Dad number one is a jerk and dad number two is an idiot. The problem here is not with the sounds in this house. It is with the way you are choosing to hear them. I think great. Dad number three is a philosopher. I say, is this going to take long? I really need to get some sleep. He tells me to shut up. Then he says, take a look at what we actually have here. You are about to take action that will curtail the sounds of laughter in your home. Is this really what you want? Would you prefer that your home be filled with the sounds of anger or crying? The sounds that fill a home are part and parcel of the memories that are created there. Quiet is what happens in a home when you are alone in it. Be careful how much of this you wish for. Then he says it again. The problem here is not with the sounds in this house. It is with the way you are choosing to hear them. And then I get it. I don't just get it a little bit. I really get it. I completely get it. I get it in the center of my solar plexus. It must be like this when suddenly one day you understand jazz. <laughs> I say to myself, what kind of a father can't go to sleep to the sound of his daughter laughing? And then instantly, as if the asking of the question initiated the metamorphosis, all the sounds emerging from my daughter's room are transformed. They become music. They become summer rain. I lie back and let them wash over me. All the pores in my body open up and absorb them. I drink in the miracle of my daughter's teenage laughter. It is magic. It is giddy. It is a sound so complete that it seems as if every one of her molecules is laughing. There is no distinction between my daughter, the young adult, and laughter itself. It is one glorious symphony, light and lovely. She sings me to sleep with laughter. I dream of woodwinds and of small birds dancing gracefully upon delicate breaths of wind. In the morning, I awake refreshed. Exhaustion is gone and will not return until the day has wrestled from me my zest. There is a distinct lightness in the early morning quiet of my home. I glance in upon the sleeping figure of my daughter, beautiful and at peace. I whistle a line from the dance of the sugar plum fairies, and I begin my day. All right, this is a pretty new song. Mm -hmm. 
In my living room, I have a crazy box. Shows me scary things and it talks and talks. Never stops all night and day. It tells me why I should be afraid. And camera crews drive by my door to look for violence, hate, and war. And they film the worst things that they see. And the crazy box shows them all to me. Be afraid, stay here, be safe. Don't go away to that other place. It's cold out there and the wind will blow. What I really mean is I need you so. We were in high school then, you had the bluest eyes, they were like looking into the summer sky, you pointed them at me and said let's get away from this factory town when we graduate. So we made a plan to go on the road to discover our future homes and when we told our friends and families almost all of them said to you and me be afraid stay here be safe don't go away to that other place it's cold out there and the wind will blow what we really mean is we need you so we lived on the road for several years learned conquered many fears after that we raised our family and when they grew up they said to you and me we've made a plan to go on the road to discover what our future holds that's when the summer sky began to cry. I saw the rain fall down from the bluest eyes. But we had made a vow in our younger days. If this day should come, we would never say. Afraid, stay here, be safe. Don't go away to that other place. It's cold out there, and the wind will blow. What we really mean is we need you so. What we really mean is we'll miss you so. is go on just go
All right, so we have a lot of musicians in uh, uh, in the room tonight. I want to tell you about a tough gig. You know, I, I performed quite a lot, and had a lot of gigs. But I'm going to play a song for you that I sang at my mother's funeral and my father's funeral. You want to talk about a tough gig? That's a tough gig, boys and girls. I don't know how I did it. I just willed myself through it. Now, when I wrote this song many years ago, I did not realize that it was a song to be sung at my parents' funeral. It was like the song had its own secret agenda. It was like a sleeper cell song or something. Now I'm looking at the rest of my songs and wondering what they're up to. <laughs> what are they going to spring on me at the end of it? I'm going to play this for, for my mom and dad who, uh, who I miss a great deal. children knew that he was dying when he asked them all to gather at his side spoke to them about the joyousness of a living from the perspective of someone about to die my love for you is what I leave behind I see my love in everything you are When I am gone and you want to find me Believe me, you won't need to look too far I will be your sense of humor I'll be your integrity time you'll find the strength to persevere right inside that strength is where I'll be when you touch a person's heart with kindness that heart opens up a room where you will stay as your heart grows I know that you will So take some time and contemplate the night sky So vast beyond all you can comprehend The magnitude of what is out around you Can make your life seem small and insignificant then picture your heart if grown to its potential As being wider than all you can ever dream And deeper than the unfathomable heavens And that's the way that my heart feels today to me And I will be your sense of humor your integrity each time you'll find the strength to persevere right inside that strength is where I'll be there's really nothing more that I can say now if you don't mind I would like to be alone want to spend a short time now in prayer to thank God for all the love that I have known now for all these hearts where my love has found a home and I will be your sense of humor I'll be your Integrity. Each time you'll find the strength to persevere. Right inside that strength is where I'll be.
that's where you can always go to be with me. All right. Thank you so much for supporting poetry and music and um, speech and creativity. Let's have a nice thank you for Cheryl and for everybody who works so hard here all the time. Um, so I'm going to leave you with a, a, a song that I've written. Um, I've been describing myself as having crested the hill a lot lately. Um, I, I raised my family. I, now I have uh, twin grandsons, thing one and thing two, I call them. <laughs> and they just learned to walk, and so it's like having two little drunk men in my house. <laughs> And I've done a lot of the great, you know, tremendous work that I needed to do in this world, raise my family and, you know, bought a house and built this gigantic folk career that I'm <laughs> exploiting out here in Metro West today. Um, so I just been, now, so as I've crested the hill and I sort of see myself plummeting toward the cemetery here, I am thinking a lot about what I want to do in my life. And I think what I want to do is be an advocate for art and for creativity and music. And I just want to give you my argument for it, okay? First of all, uh, there's no money in it, so just forget that part, all right? <laughs> But it does give you a better life, and people don't discuss this enough. If, if, if I'm 52 years old, and every weekend, because I have art, I get to meet interesting people here, interesting music, and my mind is expanding. Most people my age, it's just a natural thing for their world to get smaller. It's not good or bad. It just is that way. You've had the same job, same bunch of friends. You go fishing twice a year, whatever it is. It's just a smaller world. And I don't understand why anybody wouldn't want to have something in their life that would make their, would flip that over and make it expand. So this is my um, uh, suggestion to you if you're 10 or 110, whatever it was that you thought you could, didn't have time for, just do it. Uh, painting, poetry, music, photography, it doesn't have to be something gigantic. Just do it because the, uh, it will expand your life. That's all. You know, everybody, you can't, there's no argument to me against not having a life that's growing bigger and full of stimulation as opposed to one that's um, uh, that's shrinking or getting smaller. So here's a little pep talk for you all in the f form of a song. Thank you so much, to everybody, for coming out. I have some books and stuff over there, which I'll be happy to um, encourage you to uh, buy for your friends as Christmas presents. <laughs> This is your day, it's your time. Go light the world on fire. In the first part, if you learn what you love to do. In the middle part, if you do it a lot till it becomes a part of you. In the last part, you can give the world the best work of your life. And then you lay down with a big smile. Tell this whole world good night. Go light, go light, go light the world on fire. This is your day, it's your time. Go light the world on fire. It's a hard, dark, cold world with everybody in their cars. Your secret to go light, go light, go light the world on fire. This is your day, it's your time. Go light the world on fire, go light the world on fire. Go and light the world on fire. All right.
A number of people have, have talked about winter and, and the dark days of, of this time of year. And to honour uh, Monday, which will be the shortest day of the year, winter solstice. Flowers turn to gold and fall turns to winter for change is in the air. Moon takes centre stage as sun dips low, hiding in shadows cast long over sombre hill. Icy hands of cold reach out and speak loud to bundled ears. Winter solstice, a time for thought, a time for, for reflection. Gloomy days indeed, but within that black pool of freeze a glint of light, for the short day holds promise of the long. Embrace this winter reel and clasp it tight. Impart a passion to feed the seed of summer, which lies dormant amid this dark December day. This is a writing by my daughter. She's coming home from college today, later, hopefully ahead of the storm. The computer is gone. He came in and took it away. Well, he didn't really take it away. He threw it out. Out of the window, that is. He had said that he would do this before, but he had never had, but he never had, so I never listened. He said that it should not be ruling my life like that. But how could it be ruling my life? It's not as if I spend every waking moment on it. I just use it for my homework, email, chatting, looking things up on the internet, things like that. I always leave time for other things. He always said that he had been replaced by a machine, but that was never true. He said that I lived my life through a machine, but how could that be possible? Machines and technology are an essential part of everyday life. They haven't taken over. And now I have a new computer and he was taken away. After all, if he could do something like that to a computer, who knows what else he was capable of? Well, good riddance, I say. Now I can just look on the internet for someone new. <laughs> Defense without invisible hands around my neck. What does it mean when I make my enemy strong? Tell the enemy the truth, even when it could bring me home. What does it mean? What does it mean?
I have a I have a good friend. Uh, I've known him since he came back from Vietnam, uh, back around 1970, and uh, he was a grunt, a medic, and he lost an eye over in Vietnam. But I never knew how he lost his eye, and it didn't really seem to be something he wanted to talk about. So this month he finally told me the story of how he lost his eye, and I'm going, and I'm reading him his words, and I'm just thinking. Man, he's really heroic. He's really a hero. Uh, doing what he thought he should do at the time, doing what was necessary, but you know, really heroic. Anyway, this is and this is a poem I actually wrote uh, first visit to Africa and a little bit for my dad and the World War II generation. It's called Tunis. When I stepped on African soil, I waited for my toes to burn. The detour our guide chose. Before City Bou Said, white walls, blue shutters, gray cobblestone alleys. Before the Phoenician fields of stones, each blessing a firstborn sacrifice to Baal. Before Hannibal's Carthage, buried by Byzantine brick and Roman marble. Before Augustus' baths, Corinthian columns glaring like hawks at rows of catapult balls. Before the palace of Bardo's mosaics, ancient sandstone veins. The detour passed by. The United States Second World War Cemetery of North Africa. 2,700 markers in parade formation. My father's classmates. Grass greener than any golf course. I yearned to walk with my sons down the rows leave pebbles on each cross and star of David. Let the blood beneath our souls join us to this land. Thank you. Right, I got two little short stories. The first I wrote the night before it was time to go to the barbershop. It's called The Barbershop Blues. I got a case of the barbershop blues. My hair slowly fading, can't bear the news. When I was young on my head, there was plenty. No more to look like when I was 20. In the days of my youth, my head like a mob. Now best to hope for a thinning flat top. Of a transplant, and Doc said, Kid, you got none to spare. No big deal, Doc. Here's a graph from my ear. Only half crop, now ain't got a full stack. No big deal, Doc. Here's a graph from my back. Looking forward into the mirror, recalling my youth and memories of stealth. Reflection in front of me, silent reminder. Follicles fading like everything else. All of so far, it's approaching the chair, recalling the days of when we had hair. The older we get, the sore it grows, less in our heads, and uh-uh, more from our nose. The scissors, the rays of the barbershop comb, my eyes slightly tearing to see that chrome dome. With each return visit, I sit in the chair, recalling sweet memories of a full head of hair. Now the next one, I'll make this quick on a sad note. It's called Mortgage Trust Broken. I saw the eagle cry today. The eagle's nest was taken away. The nest was built up in a majestic tall pine, all the way at the top where no one could climb. She planned and carefully thought it all through, knowing beforehand the work she must do, then handpicked one by one a suitable branch and proceeded to build a mile high ranch. Up above the earth, so to watch the valley below from a suitable crotch. Not knowing beforehand, unable to see, another was entrusted with the care of the tree. The forest caretaker, a man of great wealth, greedily watching only out for himself, knowing beforehand how much dirty could take from the forest below and still keep it safe. Not regarding the ripple effect, he took too much dirt, not having respect for the forest floor management, but only himself. Now the trees in the forest are put in poor health. One by one they came to the ground, now the eagle's nest is nowhere to be found. Devastated by all she has lost, she won't build again. Can't cover the cost. Left only with memories of her nest so sweet, no place to go, have to nest in the street. Thank you. This time of year, um, we all get into sort of the, the holiday festivities, and everybody's family tends to have some sort of holiday ritual that they uh, that they tend to go through. And just this is a, a, a story of, of such a ritual. She brings the boxes down from the attic, each one a little different. Plain corrugated cardboard for one. Another once held peaches, fresh picked from the orchard. Yet another once held office paper. 
Their outward plainness belies their bright contents. One at a time, she sets them on the floor around her feet and then turns to face the object of her attention. The tree stands before her, its bare branches beckoning to her with anticipation. She begins opening boxes and perusing their contents. She spies her first quarry, a tangled skein of electrical wires and bulbs, and begins the slow, meticulous process of unentanglement. As each set is unwoven, she plugs it in and checks it. Anything that does not light is replaced. Oops, that one just started blinking. We can't have that. She fishes about for a replacement for that particular replacement. At last, when all the lines are straightened and all the lights are lit, she wraps the twinkling strands among the bare branches, stepping back occasionally to check for dark spots and rearrange them into light. When the last strand is in place and the light is even, she steps back one more time to admire and then pauses to make a cup of tea. And now the treasure hunt begins. She chooses a box at random and one at a time, she lifts out one memory after another. The colorful birds that brought such joy to her mother's face the clay sheep and donkey that a younger brother made in grade school, the crystal icicles that her older brother sent home when he was stationed in Europe, the silly cartoon character that an old friend had given her as a joke, even the little blue sand heart pendant that she herself had made in kindergarten, every bit of old tissue paper that she lifts out when unwrapped reveals another short story in her family's history. And she greets each as an old friend, some with laughter, some with a tear, but each and always with love. Out of habit, she puts the fragile ones as high up as possible in the branches. Even though she has no child's hand, cat's paw, or dog's tail to knock them loose from the lower branches. And finally, she opens the last box and lovingly hangs the last ornament. That leaves the tinsel. She's always conflicted about the tinsel, as it's such a hassle, but the tree never seems complete without it. She smiles at the memory that floods in of her brothers standing back and throwing great handfuls of tinsel in, in, at the tree in random globs, and her mother chasing after them and admonishing them, that's not how you put tinsel on a tree. She raises the last of her now cold tea in a toast to her mother's practicality and begins placing a few solitary strands of tinsel in a light dusting around the branches. And suddenly, the moment comes when she looks at the tree and knows that it's finally done. She packs up the wayward bits of tissue and spare bulbs into the now empty boxes and trots the boxes off to a nearby closet. She pours another cup of tea and reaches for a cookie. And she quietly raises a toast to the tree and to all of the ghosts of Christmas past who sit with her admiring it. This is called, um, this is my first architectural poem, I think. It's called Tears in My Kitchen. So you ask, how am I doing? Above the shelving, the tears line up like ducks, poised to drop, as if from a plane, taking in the whole zen sphere of the counter and its crowded belongings. Plop, plop, one by one, to spread flat and pile up all in a puddle. The ceiling reveals old veins of glue. The paper flaps like a torn blouse, telling all. From outside, my roof pillows, soft waves of gray shingles. In the attic, I can't see. The light shorts out as soon as I try. 
It too must be wet. And um, my, this last poem I'm going to read to you is from my book, Desire, and it's a Christmas poem, and it's called In the Spirit of Giving. Tom nearly hung Jimmy instead of the Christmas decorations this year. They were at each other's throats. What went where? How to place the ladder? Who got to stand on it? Secretly, they were hoping Johnny Ranzo next door would come out and see when he, hear, when he heard the ruckus. They had a bigger Santa than the Ranzos this year and more lights. Christmas is good for that, bringing families and neighbors together. <laughs> this poem I just wrote a couple days ago, so I hope it's okay. It's called uh, National Geographic. Asleep in the slave deserts of El Salvador, a child is dreaming of tangerines. He is dreaming of their pulp mashing between his teeth an aphrodisiac orange, of the juice humming through his veins, like his sister's cantering whistle as she beckons the white-nosed cattle with the sword-sharp ribs. He is dreaming of tangerines arriving carelessly. They fumble single file into sugarcane fields. He dreams little dirt hands fight for each concupiscent section, desperate in animal greed, their blood running gold in the afternoon heat, heads screaming wild for the stray nectar to grace their naked tongues. But he will not beg the tangerines their vibrance. He will take hours to suck out their hearts. All right, this is yet another seasonal poem. Um, in keeping with this, this time of year. It's called Little Lights. On Colborne Road in December, menorahs shine in my neighbor's windows. I have heard that these candle flames, one more each night, recall the wonder of a lamp, a lamp with no oil that would not stop shining. When the darkest part of the human spirit threatened the Jewish people, their lamp kept the light of God's people, all people, bright. Inside the menorah houses, the families celebrate with toys and latkes and wine and songs. The children spin dreidels and eat chocolates wrapped in gold foil. Everyone wears best clothes because remembering miracles calls for joyful trappings. Outside, I stand in the crisp, cold air under everyone's stars, loving the glorious twinkle of little lights. All right, I... Um... This is what I chose to sing for you today. Not quite sure. Is everything all right? Okay. Okay. It's called Lovelier World. It's a kind of a prayer, although I don't know who I'm praying to, or who should say what I'm praying to. Come back, oh you lovelier world, back. Into our hearts Soon The secret grief of this age Mend the broken words Give back To us our stolen lives Quell this shameful fear Calm These cruel, deceitful desires wake us to ourselves dark unchanging time each bleak measured hour slaves slaves in sterile labor longing for before And 
would grant us peace. Come and grant us peace. This is a poem I wrote recently called Holidays. If Christmas and Thanksgiving, Halloween and New Year's were all one holiday, would you like it or not? Would you wear red or green? Or would you pretend to be a witch? Would you scare people or not? Would you give presents or give thanks? Would you stuff yourself with turkey? Or would you not eat a thing? Would you play in the snow or cram your mouth with sweets? Would you set the table with cookies and milk, waiting to see what every child wishes to see? Would you like it if everything happens all at once? Uh, well, I'm going to perform a song uh, I discovered recently. I wrote it 20 years ago in honor of the new year. You know, I just hadn't looked on the dates. I thought, where did 20 years go? Uh, but this song is called, it's titled, Song for the New Year. Some of you have heard it before, and you know that uh, I ask folks to sing on the chorus, please, please. And the chorus is very easy. It's just uh, ring the bells, ring the bells, ring the bells, sung twice. The new year comes on wings of silver and gold, inviting us to take a ride. She lifts us all on board and gives us a smile, calling us to come inside, calling us to come inside. The old year now has passed, it's gone on its way, taking all our troubles and our pain. The new year lets us dream our dreams once more and restores us once again and restores us once again. Ring the bells, ring the bells, ring the bells. Oh, spring has come again with its promise of hope. New buds are pushing up through the ground. Time to work the plow and plant the seeds. Another season has come round. Another season has come round. Ring the bells. Ring the bells, ring the bells. Ring the bells, ring the bells, ring the bells. Oh, summer's almost over, autumn's drawing near. Time to take the harvest from the land. I feel the chilly wind upon my back. Winter soon will be at hand. Winter soon will be at hand. Ring the bells, ring the bells, ring the bells. Ring the bells, ring the bells. Ring the bells. The old year now has passed. It's gone on its way. We raise another glass of wine. The new year comes again and invites us all on board and takes our dreams along one more time. And takes our dreams along one more time. Ring the bells, ring the bells, ring the bells. Ring the bells, ring the bells, ring the bells, ring the bells, ring 
the bells one more time. It's a hard, dark, cold world with everybody in there. This is your day, it's your time. Go light the world on fire. In the first part, if you learn what you love to do. In the middle part, if you do it a lot till it becomes a part of you. In the last part, you can give the world the best work of your life. And then you lay down with a big smile. Tell this whole world good night. Go light, go light, go light the world on fire. This is your day, it's your time. Go we'll light the world on fire. It's a hard, dark, cold world with everybody in their cars. your secret too. Go light, go light, go light the world on fire. This is your day, it's your time. Go light the world on fire. Go light the world on fire. Go and light the world